Hello, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon again with the Metaphysical Hour. Of course, you never know if it's live or if it's Memorex, as they <laughs> used to say. <laughs> but uh, We'd be live tonight. <laughs> we're live tonight. I don't know how much, how much uh, help that is to them because when they play the tapes, we say on there we're live, too. So don't say you're live. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a book that we're just now publishing. It's called Live from the Other Side. Live, 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 live. <laughs> so it's interesting. We're talking about that. Okay. Well, we have been. We didn't go out of the out of the state this time, but we did have our class last week here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and that's the last one in the states yes. for this year. But not the last. <laughs> we'll be headed overseas, and we're going to be doing lots of trips in other countries and lots of classes there. And I'll be talking, maybe I should mention that tonight, mm, Yeah. right now while I'm thinking about right. it. Um, but in uh, the 29th, we'll be having one more show next, uh, next Friday, right. and then we mm-hmm. head out across the big pond. We're going to England again, to London, and to France. So they were going to do two classes over there if anyone is interested. And, you know, if you can uh, look on our website, you'll get more information. But the first class is going to, we're going to first do a lecture. It's going to be August the 31st at the Waldorf Hilton Hotel in London. The Waldorf Hilton Hotel in London says Alwick, I guess that's just an area of London. Right, uh, yeah, it's in London. That's Tuesday, August the 31st, we'll be doing the lecture. Then we go to Oxfordshire, which they say is not very far away. Mm-hmm. We'll be doing our class there, and that's going to be September the 3rd to the 5th. I'll be, and uh, So that'll be interesting. Anybody who's interested in the England class, you can still have time to get in. Well, in the France class, what what are those dates? You don't have those on here. It's the following weekend uh, is the France class. Yeah, I'm going to say that France. next. So, okay. Mm-hmm. But um, if you're interested in the England one, that and we've sent out emails to all of our email lists all over Europe because they said over there, you know, they're not that far away, and they can just fly over real easily. Right. So we're having the first one in the London area. That's the... Uh, the end of August and the 1st of September. Then we're going to take the channel, go underneath the channel, and end up in Paris and be headed down to the south of France. Mm -hmm. That's where we're going to do our class in France, and that's going to be the next weekend. I think it's the 12th, 15th. Well, it would be the 10th. It would be the 10th to the uh, 12th. Okay, so Mm -hmm. that's when it's going to be. In, uh, in the south of France. And they said where we're going to be is like a center that is out kind of in the middle of nowhere, but it's 20 minutes from Avion. So that is in the south of France. And that area I've always been fascinated by because, you know, with my work with Nostradamus and the three books I wrote about him, that is Nostradamus territory down there. I've always wanted to see that and see what it looks like. So we're going to try very hard to work that in when we're there is to take a little side trip and go over to see the Nostradamus Mm -hmm. Museum and the house where he lived. So that ought to be fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. So if we get back from that trip, we should have a lot to talk about. Right. And didn't you say there was another place in that area, too, that you wanted to see? Uh, Yeah, the one that's San Marie de la Mar. That is further to the south, Mm -hmm. but it's still all in the same general area. And anyone who's read my books on Jesus and the Essenes, I speak about San Marie de la Mar because after the crucifixion of Jesus, they uh, they put all their survivors, like I guess you would say all of the um, disciples, uh, Lazarus, uh, Mary, Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of Jesus. They had about 100 people, all of the main characters after the crucifixion, they said they couldn't kill them, but they decided to do it a different way. They put them all on a ship that didn't have any oars or any sails, and they just set it loose into the Mediterranean. And uh, they thought that would be a good way to kill them. They wouldn't have to do it, because how could they possibly survive 
out in the Mediterranean Sea with no sails or no oars. So the miracle of that whole thing is that they came ashore on the coast of France, and it was at San Marie de la Mar. So there is a, I know there's supposed to be some kind of a monument there, Mm -hmm. and when I've done regressions into past lives, we've done, when they've gone into the lives of the gypsies, that was like a, a special place for the gypsies. They would go there, and they said there was a grotto there, and they would hold their weddings and their different ceremonies there back in the 16, 1700s. And now what was a grotto in those days is probably a church there now Mm -hmm. because there were supposed to be statues representing the the Marys, the ones that came and and landed there. And the way the story goes, uh, it's all in the book of Jesus and the Essenes. After they landed there, they were given another boat that was much Uh more seaworthy, and they headed out again, and then they ended up in England. And... Uh, that was where the first churches were formed in uh, Glastonbury, in that area. And it is said that, I believe it was Mary Magdalene mm-hmm. that went back to France, and she started a church there. Okay. And Lazarus started one in Spain. These are all unknown facts about the early church, and I think these are miracles that really should have been included in the Bible, and they should be talked about in the church but they, they aren't. They're just forgotten about. Because the very first church was in Glastonbury. And the the abbot that lives there, they have an abbey right there, and they know this and they talk about it. They have a church there. It's supposed to be, uh, well, the one is for the, um, oh, what is it? The They have the, the well, the chalice well. And that's supposed to be where all this took place. The original church burned many, many years ago. But they said this was the very first church in the world was the, uh, they didn't call it a church. They called the religion the way in those days. It was not the Christian religion as we know it today. But it was founded by the followers of Jesus. And they said that place at Glastonbury is the holiest place in the world because the dismating disciples were buried there. And John, the disciple, lived to be 100 years old, and he's buried there. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, is buried there. So they said that is a the, the holiest places in the world. So I knew I've been to Glastonbury, but I did want to go and see San Marie de la Mar because of the stories and the history we've heard of that. And I believe it is considered a sacred place there. They probably know the story. Well, probably. It sounds like we have to go there then. I mean, you're well, that close. We have we have to go. I would just like to see it and see mm-hmm. if there's any statues or church or mm-hmm. monuments about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, before I forget, let me give out the, the toll-free number in case anyone wants to call in tonight, because we're just going to be talking about several different subjects. If anyone wants to jump in, that's perfectly okay. But the toll-free number is one 815 Nine seven five six eight 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 one five nine seven five six. But um, you know, a lot of people think that the first Christian church was in Rome, and it mm-hmm. really wasn't. That wasn't founded till over two hundred years after wow. Wow. the crucifixion. That's a long mm-hmm. time, right? And the Vatican is not the first original church in Italy either, in Rome. The original church was founded as a refuge for those who were escaping the persecution of the early Christians, and it's down the street away from the Vatican. Mm-hmm. They say there's a little sign, if you look for it, that will point you toward the first church ever in Rome. There's so many things we don't know. We just know what had been publicized, but we don't really know the real truth of what happened, and I think that's the most fascinating thing. Because they said it was into the, I believe, 1400s, there was an argument with the Vatican over which church was the first one in the world. And they never did say it was the Vatican or it was Rome. There was an argument. Was it the one in England or was it the one in France? Hmm. They knew they were the first ones. And so it was finally decided that the one in England is the oldest and the one in France 
with Mary Magdalene did come a little bit later. So these are fascinating facts. All right. <laughs> so I've done a lot of studying on this, and this is in the book Jesus and the Essenes. So anyway, I just thought I'd bring that in. If we're going to be in the area, I, and it's not going to be that far, just right. a few hours, right. I think I'd really like to go and... Oh, we'll be there. We'll go. We'll it's not a to... try or I'd like. It's, we're just going to we're do gonna it. We're going to do it. Okay. <laughs> so. Because I do want to see Nostradamus' house. Because in the three books I wrote about him, we had so much information about his house. And uh, it was always described the same. So I would like to see mm-hmm. it for real. Right. People who have been there said it's not the same because it is a museum and they really didn't get a feel that he was there anymore. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to be buried somewhere around there, too. So it ought to be interesting. He might come out of the woodwork for you, though. Maybe get a picture (laughs) of you in front of the house and he'd be standing there with you. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be interesting. We never know. We did three years of working with him consistently, Mm -hmm. so who's to say what might happen if we go... He knows your energy. If we go into that area, who's mm-hmm. to say what's going to happen? That's right. So anyway, this is the first time to go into the south of France, so we're going to see what's going to happen there. We'll have a lot of interesting things to report right. when we get back. Okay. Um, you know, this might be a good point to bring up right here before we go into some of the other subjects. We've had some very interesting uh, past lives have come up in our demonstrations mm-hmm. in the last couple of classes. Because at all of my classes, after I uh, share with people and teach them how to do my technique and how to do the healing and right. the uh, finding all the answers, on the last day we always pick someone from the class and we do a demonstration to show them how it is done. And one of these so just so happened that during her past life regression, she went back to France. Right. I guess that's why I'm thinking about that whole Mm -hmm. scenario. And she was one of the female disciples who left um, Jerusalem after the crucifixion. Right. And a lot of you out there probably don't know there were women disciples. I've written about them. And in my book, Jesus and the Essenes, and also we have published two other books by an author in England, Stuart Wilson and Joanna Prentice is the hypnotist right. that came forth with that information. And the book, The Essenes, Children of the Light, follows on continuing from my book right. about Jesus and the Essenes and gave us a lot more information. And then she, they wrote the book called The Power of the Magdala. And that is the story of Mary Magdalene and her part with the women disciples. Because Jesus had more women followers than he had men. Because it's more natural for the women. You know, They have this intuitive ability and instinctive ability. They can grasp these things better than men. I'm sorry, guys, but that's just the way it is. Well, it's no slap against the guys because we women were guys before, too. It's all, you know, I mean, <laughs> we're all the at those same. times, the men now may have been the women then. So, see, it's not... You know, you're really probably slapping the women right now. So. <laughs> well, I'm saying, I mean, by tell saying that the know, men are not as intuitive as the women are. I think they are now. They're more intuitive now. People were but, uh, going mm-hmm. along to that now. Mm-hmm. Well, they're they're more balanced. People uh-huh. are coming into both their feminine and, and masculine. Okay. So, but um, in those days, they had twelve women disciples, just like there were twelve men disciples. So they, um, they, Mary Magdalene was the one who was in charge of the women disciples. And in that book, Power of the Magdala, they go, they talk about all of the ones, they give their names. And after the crucifixion, many of them escaped. Right. They had to go and hide. A lot of them, every, all of them went into hiding, all mm-hmm. the followers. So that group went to France which is not natural, Mm -hmm. because now we know Mary Magdalene went there with the survivors, and she started her church there. Mm -hmm. So what could be more natural than to have the women disciples follow her? So in this regression, the woman all of a sudden goes back to where she is one of the women disciples, and they had just arrived in France. Now, this woman has never read my books or Stuart's books, so she'd never heard of the idea of women disciples. Mm -hmm. But she gave a very interesting account of it. 
and how they had to stay in hiding, just mm -hmm. cloistered like like you would today in a convent. And they had brought a great deal of uh, secret information with right. them and secret knowledge, and they tried to save as much as they could. And I've had that in many other regressions, mm -hmm. too, where they're always trying to save the sacred secret knowledge. So before they died, they all began dying off, and they couldn't get any more to join. Before they died, they hid a lot of the secret information. It's supposed to be there in France somewhere. Right, right, in different places. Who's to say mm -hmm. if it's still there or not? Because a lot of these things would have been discovered over the years. We know that the Masons and the different groups were looking for things mm -hmm. like that. And a lot of it probably was found. The Vatican later was trying to find as much as they could secret books and secret knowledge, but they wanted to hide it away in the in the Vatican, in the library. So a lot of it may have already been discovered. It's been so many thousands of years. But yeah. still, that's the kind of regressions I like because you got all this information. I'm always looking for hidden knowledge and right. lost knowledge. Right. So that was interesting that she came up with that on her own. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's what we usually do when we're doing these kind of uh, sessions. We never know what's going to come out when we're doing the uh, mm -hmm. the demo. And the one we just did, we had a demo. She went to a different time period. I'm trying to remember what that was. She went back to where um, she was one of the Jews in oh, Germany. Oh, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that was sad. It was a sad mm -hmm. one because she thought she was safe because she was trusting a, a German officer, and that he was uh, keeping her safe, protecting her. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were probably sexual favors involved and all of that, but she she said she didn't love him, but at least he was trying to keep her safe. But it ended up he turned her in, and so the Germans took her away and they were all put on the train mm -hmm. and taken to the death camps. Mm -hmm. And the regression ended where she was um, with the gas chambers. Mm -hmm. And I've had other people who have also gone to when they died at the gas chambers. But that was sad. But it was interesting that it turned out that the German officer who betrayed her is her husband now. Her ex-husband now. Well, yeah, they they just <laughs> yeah. got divorced. She stayed with him, oh, 30 or something years, she said. Mm -hmm. She studied, stayed in there as long as she could, and then it's like the contract is over. You don't have to do it anymore. But I've told you before that we do change roles. We switch roles around, and we come back from reasons of karma. We come back into the mm -hmm. life with the same people, just different costumes, different parts that we're playing in this illusion that we're in. Mm -hmm. For the different experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that was interesting that she went back to that lifetime. So this is the kind of things I get when I'm working in my sessions, mm -hmm. but it's interesting when you can do it where the whole class can watch. Right. And especially when you have the healings that occur, too. Right. Because the woman with the went to the where she was one of the female disciples, was born with a curvature of the spine. And it caused back problems, hip problems, all kinds of problems. Well, they they healed it. You know what I mean by they? The ones I work with, they healed it, and it was really wonderful mm -hmm. to watch. Right. Yeah, it was. It was. It was the, great. The mm -hmm. class said it was the most mind-blowing thing they'd ever mm -hmm. seen. Yeah, they say it's one thing, you know, you read all of this in the books, and then then in the class you actually get to hear sample uh, sessions, but then when you actually see it, I mean, that that's totally different, you know, and watch it happen. <laughs> it's, it's just wild. And I never know what's going to happen. No. Mm -hmm. But when it was over with, she knelt on the floor, and she said she hadn't been able to do that in years without a lot of pain. She used to do yoga exercises mm -hmm. when she was younger. She hadn't been able to do any of that. But she knelt on the floor, and she said there was no pain at all. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing I like. Right. Yep. And I had a woman just a few months ago that came through, came in there with crutches, and <laughs> said it was so funny. Um, she couldn't even go to the restroom or anything without mm -hmm. the crutches. I had to help her. And she had a driver who had 
driven her there to was going to take her back. And after the session, she got up and go to the restroom. She didn't didn't just no problem at all. She yeah. just went by herself. And then we went into the front part to have the discussion. She forgot all about the crutches. They were sitting in the corner. And when we're ready to leave, after we'd had the discussion, she gets in the car and the the driver didn't have to help her in. She just gets in and they're ready to go. And I said, oh, oh we forgot the crutches. So we went back and got them. And I took them out of the car and I said, well, I don't think you're going to need these anymore, but you might want to keep them as a souvenir. Because mm-hmm. one of the things she was told was to start a healing center. Mm-hmm. I said, that would be good to hang it on the wall and say, this is where I just came from. That's what happened before. And I don't remember off the top of my head the reasons for all these things, but that's what we do. We track down, why did this happen? Because everyone makes yourself sick. You don't, it's nothing but accident. Right. Well, the, the sickness is a message. Yeah. You know, because you're not moving in the direction that you wanted yourself to move. And so this is a way of you delivering yourself a message Mm -hmm. to get on track, to get yourself in gear. And so it's a message being delivered. It's just we forgot to give ourselves the manual of interpretation. (laughs) And so that's where we don't know how to interpret them. And so it moves on and moves on and moves on because we don't listen and it goes into a disease process. It goes into something mm-hmm. that's very serious because we're not right. paying attention. Right. So that's your job, and I will help with that job as, with the interpretation manual. You know, that's what, that's what we're doing is helping people understand the messages. Because okay. you should never be sick at all. No aches, pains, or anything. The human body is a miraculous machine that has been created to heal itself and take care of itself if we don't interfere. And this means the doctor's putting everybody on drugs, and mm-hmm. that just covers everything up. And it's not really helping at all. Well, of course not. Because <laughs> we're just putting the Band-Aid on something. Of course it doesn't help. You're not getting the message. As long as you don't get the message, nothing happens. It just gets worse. So you've got to understand the message, and then it will go away. That's what I tell people. You make yourself well, sick. It will go away when you understand the message and you take heed of the message. Yes, you <laughs> so, have to act on it. Yes. You know, if it's telling you to go a different direction, okay, I got the message, but you don't move, well, it still won't happen. It'll you come know, back. You have to do whatever it was you set in motion for yourself to do. But you make yourself sick, and I know a lot of people tell me, what do you mean? I don't want to be sick. I didn't do this to myself. But if you, your mind is powerful enough to make yourself sick, it's also powerful enough to heal you. Once we just find out, why did I do this? What was it all about? What was the reason for it? Right. And, um, hmm, I've got several different things along that line I was going to cover if it's... Um, I don't know what else we're supposed to talk about tonight. We have several different we're just, topics. We're just ad-libbing here. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> hmm. Well, one thing I thought was interesting was two cases I just did, and these were two sisters that came all the way from Ireland. And they come from all over the world. They come mm-hmm. everywhere here to have sessions. I don't encourage people coming that far. hmm But they come with all kinds of reasons, all kinds of things they're looking for. And I think if they're motivated to come that far, I think that's the first step of uh, helping because they really want to be helped Mm -hmm. if they're going to come so far. But the reason I want to bring this up, and I'm not naming any names or anything, Mm Julie's kind of shaking her head at me. I'm well, not... you've already given too much information. Well, <laughs> so. there's a lot of people in those countries. <laughs> anyway, I think the most important thing about this deals with genetic diseases because the doctors are always no saying... No such thing, people. <laughs> yeah, they are always saying you have a defective gene, mm-hmm. and that gene will create a disease. Mm-hmm. And it's supposed to be hereditary and mm-hmm. follow down through you have generations. propensity, da, da 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 It always comes to you. You chose that. Yeah. You did not have to take that on. It may have been sitting there as a possibility, and you chose to take it. That's all that is. 
Yeah, that's it. (laughs) That's what I've found. They've said many times, just because the gene is there, the effective gene is there that could possibly create this disease, like the doctors Mm -hmm. say, Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it has to happen. No. No, you don't have to take it. It's you always chose it for the reason to give yourself the message. Yeah, it's always the person, and do they choose to go that route? Right, exactly. If there it would be an easy route to exactly. do. Exactly, just like there's all kinds of other things out there that we could grab onto at any moment. Yeah. Anyone you wanted, it's all there. I mean, if you really want to get obsessed about all the germs and all the things out there, you could, because it's that way. You could grab any of those things. Well, they say that... Um, Everyone has the cancer germs in their body. Mm-hmm. You yeah. have all of this. It's right. just a matter of whether it's going to be activated at any right. given time. And that depends on you. Yeah, because we found that the cancer is caused by the uh, suppressed anger. Right. Now, a lot of this stuff is caused by suppressed anger, by stress. Well, I'm not going to go into what the disease is that these were, but mm-hmm. it was supposed to be genetic. And the mother had died of it, Mm -hmm. and she died horribly with it. Mm -hmm. So naturally, the daughters are terrified. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because the doctors are telling them, 50% chance you're going to get it. And what's the other law? Law of attraction. Whatever you fear, you bring toward you. Yeah. So (laughs) there. Because they had had to be the caretaker for the mother. They saw what happened, and all they could think about, well, according to the doctors, this is Mm -hmm. going to happen to me. Mm Mm-hmm. And I can pass it on to my children because it's in the genes and it's hereditary. So uh, it's a shame what people put themselves through, but these girls didn't know anything about metaphysics. Right. They came on faith alone, and I had to spend a lot of time explaining reincarnation and explaining a lot of these things because they had never thought of these alternative ideas, and that, that makes a big difference. Yeah, but look how empowered they were when just just knowing that you chose it just knowing that that's empowering to me it's empowering some people are like well that's crazy well it's empowering because if you chose that then you can choose something else if i chose that i can unchoose it or i can choose something else yeah it's totally empowering it puts it all right back in your hands of you know in control so but the one sister was they the doctors were saying she was already developing this the symptoms so naturally, she's terrified. Sure. And the symptoms she was developing, I didn't think they were that bad. They could be something anybody could go through. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't know about this gene lurking in the shadows, uh, you wouldn't even think anything about it. You'd just go on living your life. Right. But instead, having the doctors say that, then they're looking for every little tiny clue. Right. And every time she goes back to the doctor, they say, well, these are the first symptoms. That means it's coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't like that. Wouldn't they say the monster in the attic or something? You're waiting for it to pounce? Yeah, let's just create a lot of fear here. Oh, it's a lot of fear. And that was, I had Yeah, but see, they presented that to themselves to grow through. Yes. For that very reason. They wanted... That's what this time's about right now. A lot of it is to present a lot of fear because that's one of the things we really have to move through and understand and not let it paralyze us. You know, you've got to know, you got to recognize it and know it for what it is. It's an illusion itself, it's, and it, it creates its own little personalities and beings and everything, but it's an illusion. And it draws the very thing mm-hmm. you're afraid of will be drawn to you right? because fear is the strongest emotion a human has you're afraid of something, naturally you're going to focus mm-hmm. on it, you're going to give it energy. Right. You give it energy mm-hmm. and it gives it life. Right. And that's why there's a lot of stuff going on right now that could be fear-producing. It looks scary uh-huh. because it's this is us de- pre- presenting these things to ourselves so that we will recognize it and lim- you know move through it and, and just say, okay, no, 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 I know what that is. Go away. It's not for me. Yeah. It's not my life. So. But I had to really do a lot of work with them because we had to get away from the fear and away from the, the fear the doctors were creating, too. Yeah. yeah. That this is going to happen, and they kept saying there's no cure for it. And imagine how awful that would be to have people in that mindset. Mm-hmm. But we, we were able to help them a great deal. That was the important yeah, thing. Yeah, Absolutely. 
after yeah. this after the session, they said they felt such peace and calmness and such freedom as mm -hmm. though they were finally released from it all. Good. Because yeah. they realized they didn't have to to create this. They didn't have to do it. Right. And we went through the mother, her problems mm -hmm. in her life, and showing them that was why the mother chose right. to create it too. Right. But, of course, it was too late, and they mm -hmm. weren't thinking of the, in that way in those days. But it's not too late for the, the two sisters because now they can realize I don't have to experience this just because they say it's genetic and I have to get it. It's up to you. You don't right. have to believe that. Right. Because I've had I had a woman just a few months ago who told me when she came in, the doctors say I have three months to live. She said according to that timeline, she said I've got about six weeks left. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you think? Do you, and she said, I don't think so. I don't believe it. Right. That's the first step. We have to operate from our heart. Our heart knows. Mm -hmm. Our heart, you've got, you've got to be your own truth bearer, truth whatever. You, and you've got to have your discerning. I was going to say your discerning hat, but it actually comes from the heart. Your discernment factor is in the heart. So your heart knows. It knows the truth. And if that doesn't feel right, don't go with it. Don't listen. <laughs> That's not your truth. That may be that doctor's truth or that other person's truth. That's not your truth. And they're just going by the book, by what they've been taught in medical school. That's all they know is just what mm -hmm. they've been taught. It doesn't mean it has to happen. They've told me many times that they know they don't heal anyone. The person heals themselves. Right. Yeah, they, they can. They're a help. I mean, doctors have their place. They absolutely yes. do. You know, but it's just. Always, always, always with anybody, with us, anybody telling you stuff, put your discernment factor in there and you take your own truth out of it, what's what's right for you. Don't ever believe somebody just because of who they are. You have to make your own decisions ask, for you. Ask lots and lots of questions. Research it out. And if it doesn't make sense, then make up your own mind. Right. Create your own truth. But that's what happens when I get them and they say, the doctors say, I'm going to die. And I say, what do you think? And they'll say, I'm not ready to go yet. Yeah. I've got things I've got to do. Mm -hmm. You could just as easily give up mm -hmm. because they said it's going to happen. But uh, they've told that they've had that joke about um, the doctors keep the patient entertained while mm -hmm. the body heals itself. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> Which is a good thing to say because that's exactly what happens. They say a lot of times they know they didn't have anything to do with it. The body was taking care of itself. Well, the body can. It oh, knows yeah. how to do it. If you don't mess with it too much, <laughs> it knows how to do it. And when we were doing the awakening tour and Tabash was do saying mm -hmm. all these things, one of the things he brought up was mm -hmm. how the body can heal itself and mm -hmm. take care of itself. Right. But he said if you go taking all these drugs, then the body says, okay, I, you don't need me. You don't right. need that yeah, part. Yeah, you've got that over there to do it. So, <laughs> And you're depending on that crutch there. Mm -hmm. It says, all right, we'll just turn it off then. Yeah. If you don't feel you want us to heal the body, we'll right. just... Or us to take care of that or whatever because it can. Yeah, it can. Yeah. But if you just decide, okay, I'm going to fill it full of all these drugs, which really kind of deaden mm -hmm. the whole process, well, then it's, it's down to shut things down. Right. Because they have said every drug has a side effect. And sometimes the side effects are worse than the disease itself. Mm -hmm. Or it creates the disease yes. <laughs> that it's supposed to be trying to... Whatever it's whatever. trying to get rid of, sometimes it can create it. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of strange things about all this, and they definitely don't have all the answers. That's why you got to trust your own body. It knows right. what it's doing, mm -hmm. and it can take care of you. Trust your body and love your body. This is something I've recently been going through, and I didn't realize how I didn't, how I felt. I mean, I wasn't happy with my body, but I thought, that's okay. I mean, it's here. It's doing its job, da, 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 da. And I was like, I had this little disconnect and everything. And I kept reading and things. It says, love your body, love your body, love your body. Well, somewhere along the line, well, I started working out. I started training. And I started because developing. You were overweight. Yeah, and I started yeah. developing a strength. And I highly recommend this for anybody. 
do strength training. It empowers you. It gives you. Um, it makes you. It, what what it's hap- it, it makes you feel strong. It makes you feel good. But what it also did is it connected me to my body. It gave me a, an appreciation for my body. And with all of that, somewhere in that whole process. I have started loving my body. I'm loving myself. And in that, the weight's coming off. And it's because that's how the body works in synchronicity. But if you've got to love yourself, you know, you've got to love it and appreciate it, well, it's hard to do that when you have a disconnect and you don't do it. And I didn't realize how much of one I had until I started. To, but, that, but you've got to get in touch. And I think that's something else I'm reading is this is a time right now where we do need to be in touch with our bodies because we're taking our bodies through stuff. And so it's good to be in touch with our bodies. Mm-hmm. And, and the changes in the vibration and the right. frequencies are definitely affecting our body. Right. And there's a lot of them out there who don't understand what's mm-hmm. really happening. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So they are fighting it. They're mm-hmm. having a problem with it. And they of hate themselves and they do all that, 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 that. Well, how can you work in synchronicity with something if you hate it? Yeah. You know, it's got to be a love affair. You know, and it's not hard because this is you. This is your housing, so it's not hard to do. You know, once you, but you've got to understand it. And like I said, when I saw the strength, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm strong. And it also developed something else. It, it builds a, a strength, a mental strength to it. It starts going, I can do anything. You start getting this. That's what I'm saying. It empowers you. you, you it's just a strength. Um, and it's, I didn't realize that. I mean, I was doing walking and all that stuff, but there's something about strength training, and you see what your body can do. It does things you never thought it could do. (laughs) And that's when you start going, well, if it can do that, well, maybe I can do that. You start realizing, I don't have limitations. So see, it starts taking you to other places metaphysically that you wouldn't think, you almost think like, well, I have, the body isn't important. You know, I, this I have to be up here. This is what's important. All up my in the, uh, the astral areas yeah. and all my 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 higher level learning, and my body can't get me there. I it will. You strengthen your body. You see how strong you can be, and you start going. I can do this. I can do things I didn't know I could do. That takes you to another level. It starts releasing limitations and. Now I can do anything. You know the body can, and something about that goes into the brain and says, I can. Mm-hmm. I can do anything. Well, that's that's all this up here, you know. Well, so they, they always said, it's even in the Bible, the body is the temple. Absolutely. And why would you ever want to harm or damage your temple? Right, right. You want to keep it as healthy as you can. Absolutely. The best mm-hmm. shape you can. Oh, well, somebody in our class asked a funny question, and I thought, where in the world did they oh. come up with something <laughs> like that? Yeah. She said, "Does the you know we talk about mm-hmm. the subconscious, the higher self that I work with?" Said, "Does the higher self ever say it's okay to smoke?" Mm-hmm. And I said, <laughs> "Definitely not." Right. I said, "They would never tell you to do something that they know is going to right. harm." They your would body. never tell you to put toxins in your body. Yeah, they always mm-hmm. want to get the toxins out. Right. Mm-hmm. And they always say, you should see what it looks like from in here. Right. I have seen what it looks like from in there. It's yuck. <laughs> and some of these bodies. So, uh, yeah, it's it's yucky. So um, I said, where would you ever get the idea that it to say, it's okay, you can go ahead and smoke and oh, do all those things, mm-hmm. unless she was trying to find an excuse for herself. Possibly. I mean, there, there was some ulterior thing there, um, thinking, well, there might be some times that it's okay. Uh-huh. But toxins in the body are not okay. No, so. and we want to get them out of there as best, much crazy as we can because right. this is what affects a lot of the major organs. Mm-hmm. Well, this is right. important once you start realizing all of this. I had a question. Uh, this occurred to me um, in one of the last two classes. Yeah. It just kind of came in, and I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to ask it correctly because it's one of those mind-bending things that it's um, <laughs> That we're not used to. No, we to. <laughs> don't do things like that. But, um, it w- okay, it came in. It's like, okay, we go to these past lives, and you see all these past things and stuff like that. And it was like, it was just a flashing thought was, did any of these past 
I mean, are we the first generation or are we the first ones that are probing into all this past stuff and trying to answer all this stuff and trying to sort all this stuff out for ourselves to grow and to da 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 you know what I'm saying? Now, I know it's in the Bible or in the Jesus time they were doing things, so I remember that. But it's like, you know, all these people going back to past lives, do they ever think about or do you ever get that, that sensation from them that they're – thinking about why they're doing this and how this relates to this and what this has to do with. See, like how we do now. Well, I wonder if this is karmic because of this happened over you here. You mean you know in the saying? other lives? Yeah. And it's like, did they, in those other lives, did they do that? I don't think so because 90% of the ones I do were very simple, ordinary lives mm-hmm. where all they did was try to live one day to the next. Right, and, and, and it could be just the time. Of- those times we weren't developed to that stage oh, yet. Yeah, now we, we are, you know. So. There were the mystery schools, the mm-hmm. secret schools of knowledge, and they were trained. Right. They were look looking. At, yeah, they mm-hmm. were trained to look into things and to know there was more and to know the different procedures, rituals, and things to advance their minds. Now, has stuff like that always been going on all along? Yeah, okay. those were always mm-hmm. the secret schools, right, the ones everybody was always right. trying to destroy and kill people. Mm-hmm. But the average man on the street or in the market or in the field didn't have time. He didn't know right. about any of it. Right. So he like, just, like today. I mean, the yeah. average person doesn't. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, there's always been those who have wanted to know more and wanted mm-hmm. to find the answers and put it all together. And there, But then another life, they may go back to being a farmer in the field. It right, just depends. Right. What the but, you know, is. even your everyday person here, it's always like, why am I here? Mm-hmm. Do you hear them saying that in these other simple everyday life? Do they say, why am I here? What am I doing? What am I, I know? don't think so, but maybe they did in these secret schools. Right, but I'm saying the average person in the field, you know, that no, they digging potato did. lives, did they wonder why they were there? No, they just wanted to have as good a life as they can. Mm-hmm. They grieved when someone mm-hmm. died. They were just living. They were just living yeah. their lives. That's okay. all it was. But mm-hmm. in all of those lives, there was always something that related to the person I was mm-hmm. working with now, right. the client, right. even mm-hmm. if it was something very simple. Well, in we... fact, in one of the classes we just did, this one man, we was talk a demo, and he said there was one lesson the person learned mm-hmm. from the lifetime. And he said, you mean that whole lifetime and they only learned one right. thing? Well, that was how the time worked. Our time is so different now. We, we, like, the, like you, early on, you were getting that we were living 10 lives in one lifetime. Now, that was 30 years ago. Yeah. Imagine what it's like now. It's even more probably than 10. Because they said we had so much karma to repay mm-hmm. that uh, it would take you 10 lifetimes. So now we're doing it all in one. So a lot of the, we're learning probably a lot of lessons in mm-hmm. one lifetime. We're living longer, too. We have more time to work it out. Right. Well, so we're, we're just we're just a lot more complicated now. Oh yeah. I mean, we're, we're now we're becoming more aware of our multidimensionality. I mean, we we know all these things that we're doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, we may not be able to see them yet, but we're starting to think about it and but grasp the ideas of them. There's always been people down through history that had mm-hmm. the knowledge and tried to pass it on to others, okay. and they were always tried to be stopped mm-hmm. by the powers that be, the mm-hmm. religious organizations or whatever. Okay. Oh, there's something I want to bring up that just was on the Today Show today. And I'm going to bring it up before we run yeah. out of time here. I can't believe how the time just went by. Speaking <laughs> of time. <laughs> oh, yeah, time on when we get to going, mm-hmm. time just passes so quickly. But if you remember, I'm lecturing a lot on this now. Everywhere I go, it's a big thing. We keep talking about the new earth and about the three waves of volunteers who have come in since the end of um, World War II mm-hmm. and how they've all come in to help with the earth, to help the people to ascend. And they've come from many other places, and they're all here for different reasons. And the three waves were the first wave. I don't want to go into a lot of detail mm-hmm. on this, this tonight. I do it a lot in my radio, in my uh, lectures, and I've talked about it mm-hmm. on here before. The first one were the ones that were right after World War II, we called the baby boomers. Mm-hmm. And uh, they would be in the 50s, 60s, right, early 60s right mm-hmm. now. Then the second group after that would be 20s, 30s, mm-hmm. about that age. Anyway, the last group, the third wave, is the new children. They're the ones that have been coming in. Some of these are getting up there into puberty now Mm -hmm. because they're growing older. But um, these new children are the ones that we're more concerned about 
And our company has even published a book about them. We call it like the care and feeding of the new children. Right. Right. And it's for the parents and the teachers to know how to deal with these well, new as, groups. As well as the kids themselves, so that it helps, it gives them support, too. So. Yeah, we've had Nikki mm-hmm. Patello, the author, mm-hmm. on our show, and uh, so they can understand right. it. The, the book is uh, Children of the Stars, right. mm-hmm. and it talks about this new group. And we know that this group have is the been the one that is, I don't want to say mistreated by the schools or the medical profession or whatever. Misunderstood. Misunderstood. Let's put it that way. Because these new kids, they thought there was something strange about them and different, and they diagnosed so many of them with ADHD, Mm -hmm. attention deficit disorders. Mm -hmm. And so they began putting a lot of them on Ritalin. And they kind of uh, separated them from the rest. You've got to do these things to make them normal. Mm-hmm. They were disruptive and all of that. So they put them on these drugs. Right. And in my work, it said time and time again, don't put them on the drugs. One thing that happens is you lower that frequency, that vibration of their body, try to bring them into normal, but actually you keep them from uh, reaching the heights that they should have been at. Right. Am I saying that right or not? I think so, close enough probably. They're, it's numbing them out. And, numbing, that's mm-hmm, a good word, mm-hmm. because these drugs I mean, will do so that. So much of their job here is to affect other people with their energy, and if you're numbing them out and dulling them down, you can't, they can't do their job. <laughs> you know, well, so. they're called the new kids on the block. They have tremendous intelligence, and they know things. They know the answers to problems. They know a lot of things that the adults don't know. They're the whole new generation. They're called the gift to the world. Well, you know, I've lectured on that a lot is don't put them on these drugs to, you know, let them develop. And this morning on the Today Show, I was amazed. I said, finally, have they been reading my books or have <laughs> are they finally or figured it out? Time. Yeah. Maybe it's mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. But they had psychiatrists on there, and what's just what they said. A hundred million children have been misdiagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. I've always said that. How could there be so many? All of a sudden, we got this, all these kids, that there's something wrong with them. A hundred million children, that's a lot of children, have been misdiagnosed. Now, look at how many of those children have been put on Ritalin, have been suppressed, and have been pushed over to the side. Mm -hmm. Don't let them develop their potential. Right. That's a lot. And the psychiatrist said, any time there's an increase in anything, you better look at it. She said, in the over the last 20 years, there's been a 500 percent increase in children being diagnosed with attention deficit. A 500 percent increase in 20 years. And she said, that's not normal. When you look at that, something doesn't increase all of a sudden in just 20 years to that that big of a deal. So there must be something wrong here. And that's when they began looking into it and finding out they've been misdiagnosed. There wasn't anything wrong with these kids. Well, they're just different. <laughs> they're just different. <laughs> but, you know, look at our own kids. When they were little... Sure, we had hyperactive kids. You had kids that run around the house, wouldn't calm down, yell and scream, and want to climb the wall. We just said, oh, that's just them. You know, that's their personality. Or they're the same way. You know, kids are just being kids. We always used to say, go outside and run off some steam. Run around the yard or something. We wouldn't put them on any drugs anyway. But this is what they said on the show. They're coming up with some solutions here. They think that we're sending to some of these children to school too early, that you have the five-year-olds and they're not really ready to go to school yet. They're not mature enough. Mm-hmm. And you put them in a, a class, even in kindergarten, first grade, with these kids that are a little older, and by that time they've kind of calmed down. The little kids don't know yet how to calm down. And they're not used to it. All of a sudden, they're in school. They've been running around and having a ball, you know, being mm-hmm. a kid. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you bring them to school, and you put them into a grade, and they're not even ready to start school yet. 
they are going to be rambunctious because they said they're bored, they're rambunctious, they can't sit still. You know yourself, some of your kids can't sit still that long. Well, that's not the child's way. <laughs> well, the kid wants to be up and going yeah, all yeah, the time. Yeah, they have perpetual energy. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> no, that's not the way of a child. So. Talk about the energi- Energizer Bunny. Absolutely. And they said it's impossible for them to just sit still that long. If you look at it that way, it's natural. They said recess is the best time for them. They look forward to recess when they go out and run around and burn off the energy. So they think maybe they shouldn't be allowed, the really young ones shouldn't be allowed to go to school that young until you can see they're really... Well, they really kept doing it younger and younger and younger. I think some school they're starting them at two and things. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's preschool and pre-preschool, and I mean, that's really... Just a convenience thing, you know. It's just okay. Rather than daycare, they're going to school, and that's it. it probably is too much structure, yeah. you know. They, you gotta, they're not being able to just be let free, the kid you know? be a kid. That's what uh, they said. That's one of the things they think we're doing wrong, and they're also noticing. And I think you notice the same thing: is that the teachers have too many children in the class. Mm-hmm. It's not their fault. They're overworked. They're stressed out. They've got to make all these kids mm-hmm. behave. And say you've got a good, you got a good sized class, and you got one kid in the class who's rambunctious. He wants to run around. He's bored, which is normal for that kid. Mm-hmm. So the only solution they have is, well, let's send a note home to the parents and get put them on Ritalin. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what I've heard. The doctors don't diagnose it. No, the teachers do. Right. And they'll say, you've got to take this kid to the doctor and put him on a, a medication. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's more the convenience of the teachers. And I can understand the teachers. Mm-hmm. They're overworked, too. Mm-hmm. There's too much, too many kids in the mm-hmm. class. But you got to think of the kid, too. Mm-hmm. So these, uh, some of the advice that they were giving on the Today Show, they said, go to the school And just sit in on the class and watch and see what happens. Usually they'll let you do it. Mm -hmm. And see if the teacher is overworked, if she has too many kids and they're acting up and she can't handle it. Then they said if that's the case, then take go to the principal, Mm -hmm. the school board, talk to them and say, we think you should hire an aide to help in that class. And they said the school has to do that. They have to hire an aide to help the teacher if they think there's a problem. I don't think it comes back on, well, you're not doing your job, mm-hmm. so we're just going to right. uh, you know, push you out. It's not that. You need help. And so they said they will give them an aide. If they won't do that, they say, ask if your child can be put into another class where there isn't as much pressure and isn't as much um, uh, going on like mm-hmm. that. And I think this was a really good show, and I was so surprised. Finally, they're admitting what I've been saying all along. It goes back to the same stuff about the uh, having epidemics of obesity, epidemics of diabetes, mm-hmm. epidemics of autism. Well, all of this will come to light as time keeps going. I mean, yeah. because it is time for us to understand these things and know that we're not victims <laughs> here. You know, we are in charge and we we are doing all of this. So, and I've had people on my show who have say that the reasons why all these things are happening. But I think that was really good that Today Show finally admitted that 100 million children misdiagnosed Mm -hmm. and put on Ritalin Mm -hmm. and try to push them aside. They're different. And it does affect their brain after a while. There's no way it can't. But their solutions, the ones I work with, said give the child a challenge, something to do that will occupy its mind, something that's different, that the other kids are working on and they're bored, they need something else. They said, give them a challenge. Even if you just give them something to tear apart and put back together again, it's something to keep them occupied. Are the older children, give them a a, a thesis, another mm-hmm. a report mm-hmm. to go and research and, and write about. These are the things you need to do because it'll keep the kid's mind occupied. And, and you might be really surprised with what they come up with because they're very creative. Oh, yes. You know? 
So but, let them create. Mm-hmm. You know, give them, give Instead them. of being bored. Mm-hmm. Because I did see a show a couple of years ago on NOVA. Some of these kids have graduated mm-hmm. from college at only 10 years old. Mm-hmm. And many of these kids have already founded their own companies and organizations. And it's interesting that the organizations they are founding have to do with helping the children of the world. They have a lot of potential if we just don't dampen them down. So anyway, I thought it was very important mm-hmm. that they gave, gave that. I'm right. glad I got to see it. I said, right. wow, mm-hmm. I've been saying it all along. Mm-hmm. Maybe they've been reading my books. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay, well, we're coming to the top of the hour again now. And it said it's just flown by. Absolutely. We had no idea what we were going to talk about when we started out. Yeah, just talkaholic. So what? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things we're involved with. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, if you want any information about the classes we're going to be doing in England and France, you can check on our website, www.ozarkmountain. And that's abbreviated, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. Or if you're in Europe, it's O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. Or you can just type in my name. Right. Mm -hmm. Dolores Cannon. Dot com. Any spelling Mm -hmm. of it, and it will come up. And you'll Mm -hmm. have more information about the two Mm -hmm. classes, the one in England and the one in... Yeah, there will be a button that says hypnosis classes, I think. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. the schedule, the schedule part. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, we're home for a little while, and then we're going to be off again. So we'll talk to you again next week. So thanks for listening tonight. And good night, everybody. Good night. Choose a wonderful reality. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.